Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello and welcome to another edition of Wrestling With Heart. This is the show where we talk to professional wrestlers and professional wrestling personalities about their lives in and outside of the ring, as well as doing acts of charity work, community service, volunteering, and spreading positivity. We're all about the positivity here on the show, and I've got a very special guest with me. He has worked for numerous promotions across the United States, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. He's worked the Independence, Memphis, worked for TNA Wrestling, also had a little stint in WWE as well. I'm pleased to welcome the one and only Andy Douglas, a.k.a. Dr. Andy Roberts. Andy, welcome to Wrestling With Heart. Thanks, man. Thanks for inviting me to the show. Looking forward to it. Yes, it's my pleasure. So you're from Moorhead, Kentucky. Tell me about your upbringing and childhood. Yeah, uh, born and raised in Moorhead, Kentucky. Small school, small hometown. Um, Not a lot going on there, but... um, yeah, born and raised in Eastern Kentucky, stuck around there for four years at, at MSU. Um, and then as soon as I graduated, I'd already been coming down to Nashville on the weekends and fell in love with the Nashville area. And so immediately after I graduated MSU, I relocated to, to Nashville. Nashville is definitely a, a hot area. Um, mm-hmm. Just so many it's a, venues. It's a whole different city now than it was 20 years ago. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> it's bi- it's big here, man. A lot of tourism has picked up big time. Yep. Um, okay, so professional wrestling was was that something you loved as a kid and just said I have to do this? Yeah, well, not something that I thought I had to do or even thought that it was even a possibility, but it was definitely something I grew up on. Um, both NWA and WWF. Um You know, loved all the the usual big names that everybody loved back in the day, but especially guys like uh, Jake Roberts. You know, my my real last name is Roberts, and my dad, ever since I was a little kid, had convinced me that Jake Roberts was my uncle, and he's not. Uh, But I always went to, used to brag at at school that he was my uncle, and not not the case. But all those guys, um, yeah, I just grew up loving it, and... uh, when the opportunity came about to try to give it a shot, it just kind of happened. And next thing I knew, it was just like a rocket ship, man. It just took off. Who were your favorite wrestlers growing up? Well, if you're, if you're talking about the WWF days, it would definitely be like Jake Roberts and Roddy Piper. Um, that kind of era of group. But I really liked a lot of the, the NWA stuff. So the Rock and Roll Express the road warriors. I I always loved tag team wrestling. Uh, Singles wrestling was great. It it just always had a special place in my heart for tag team wrestling. So uh, those type of guys, the midnight express flair, all those guys in the NWA, I was more of a kind of the, the, the wrestling fan with the NWA style, not as much as the cartoony stuff, the WWF, but I mean, I still watched it and still loved it. So kind of, kind of enjoyed both sides. Definitely some differences because the NWA was very sports centric, a yeah. lot of, you know, down and dirty, very technical, um, whereas WWE and a, lot more... of fighting and a lot of blood at the time back in the day, as opposed yeah. to WWF, not so much. Right. WWE was more the character driven showmanship, big muscular yeah. guys. There's definitely a lot of uh, different styles. Yeah, for sure. All right. So the moment you said, I've got to do this, can you tell me where you were when you said, this is what I want to do for a living? Yeah, I know exactly where I was because I I was attending college at Moorhead State at the time. A local independent show came to to my hometown at the Carl Perkins building, went with a bunch of college buddies. Um, Most of the guys, most of the wrestlers on the show were really small, really skinny, didn't look athletic. Uh, and it, it was at, at that moment, I was like, man, if those guys can do it, I'm pretty sure I can do this. Um, talked to the promoter after the show, and it wasn't too much longer after that that I was training. Probably only trained for three or four months before I had my first match. And then that's when the learning really started to, to begin. Yeah. And training to be a pro wrestler is very, very hard. It's, it's very intense as I've spoken to a lot of different people on the show about what was your experience like? 
Well, when I started, the ring that they had set up was in an old abandoned elementary school. It was like in the cafeteria. And since it was abandoned, there was no heat, there was no air conditioning. Uh, and my training took place in probably October, November, December, that type of time span. So it was really cold outside. Yeah, the winter, really. Mm -hmm. um, maybe into January. But anyway, it was really cold. So we would be in there and you're freezing to death. You're hitting the ropes. You're taking bumps and you're already, like I said, freezing to death. So everything just hurt more. It was almost impossible to get warmed up. Um, so it was, it was not a fun process. And I think when I started, there was probably eight or nine people that were training at the time. And I think out of those eight or nine, there was just two of us that actually ever moved on to actually having a match. Wow. They just dropped off pretty quick. What school were you training at at the time? It wasn't a school. I mean, it, the ring was set up in an old elementary school, but it wasn't like a wrestling I don't think they even had a name. It was just the promoter of that show that I had been to. His main guy, Killer Kurt, was the local guy who, if anybody needed training, he was the one that would hold classes, hold sessions. So as far as like a school name, there I don't think they had I got gotcha. you. Okay. Wrestling, wrestling training in an elementary school cafeteria. Wow. That image does just not... It just yeah, it and no less well <laughs> during the day when there was at least some sunshine coming through the windows. Yeah, must be a glimmer of hope that that if you take the class and do well, you'll make it far. Yeah, yeah. Just, All right. You just wanted the chance. You wanted the opportunity to to see what you could do. Sure. Okay. Well, what were some things that you took away from your training experiences? Any pieces of advice that the trainer said that stuck with you? Oh gosh, that's forever ago. Um, maybe not necessarily while I was training, but once I actually started doing shows and around a lot of veterans, some of the best advice I ever got was from the older guys in the locker room or traveling down the road with the older guys. And a lot of it was just common sense stuff like slow down, take your time, don't try to do so much, trying to make a young guy understand that there is such a thing as having a bump card. Like there's only so many bumps in your body. You know, you, when there's 10 people in the crowd, maybe not do 15 flips off the top rope, that type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that, that was always, I got super lucky, man. Like I said, trained in a, in an abandoned school that could have gone horribly wrong. I could have given my money to somebody that didn't know what they were doing. I could have gotten taken to the cleaners but I got super lucky with the, the, the guy that trained me was quality. He knew what he was doing. He trained me well. And then the group of guys that I kind of started with in my local, like, independent circuit were all quality guys, guys who knew what they were doing, were good workers. Yeah, they would take you out there being a greenhorn and, and rough you up pretty good and, you know, stretch you a few times. But it was with a purpose. They weren't out there trying to hurt you just for the sake of hurting you. They were, you know, putting it a little snug, taking a little further than normal in a teaching moment, in a teaching way, so that you really kind of understood what you were doing and what you were getting into. Tough love, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. All right. So you got your training, start working some matches, you, you make it to the independent scene. What was that experience like before you hit the big time? Man, and that would be my number one advice for anybody that's training now. Although, honestly, my advice is meaningless because the wrestling business nowadays is nothing like it was when I was in and especially before that. It's such a different world now. But I would highly advise those guys, especially if you do have the potential to make it to the big time, to make it to a contracted position, enjoy – that climb enjoy that process because if as i look back on my career that was the most fun time of my career that's when wrestling was fun once we got contracted with tna and as we climbed that ladder in tna professional wrestling got less and less fun and it was more this is a job and so i would say 
if you never make it to that pinnacle or if you've got a good chance of making it to that pinnacle, enjoy, enjoy the time and don't, don't look at it as being beneath or less than. Yeah. Some pretty good advice there. Little words of wisdom, but yeah, you made it to TNA. I mean, at that time it was a growing promotion. Jeff Jarrett was there. Mm -hmm. Uh, What was it like working for TNA? Man, it was, it was pretty awesome because at first, you know, Chase and I both lived in Nashville and that's when they were running out of the asylum, the Tennessee fairgrounds. And they were uh, doing every Wednesday night, the weekly pay-per-views and they would always have dark matches on explosion before the actual pay-per-view went live. And there for a while, like we were pretty consistent doing dark matches. And some of the reason was, I think they knew they could rely on us when we were local. If they had somebody not show up, they could call us in a short period of time and get us to come in. Um, but they knew that we could work with any type of guy that they wanted us to work with. Um, so that was pretty awesome. Just getting that experience and that opportunity and being around, you know, they were bringing in some really, really big names at the time. So, Mm -hmm. you know, being fairly new into the business, you know, here I was marking out with some of these names coming in. I was like, yeah, man, there's this guy, there's this guy. I watched that guy when I was growing up. That, I mean, it was pretty cool. And so to only be a few years into the business and then, be in that position was pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, you got to work with so many different people, uh, seeing guys like uh, DDP and Sting and Jeff Hardy, guys like AJ Styles and Abyss on the rise. I mean, can't get any better than that. I mean, come on. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, Road Dogg and Billy Gunn and all those guys that they brought in. But looking back on it too, during that building phase, as you look at where TNA Impact was later and even where it is today or the guys that have moved on, all those original TNA guys, I mean, we were all fighting and scri- you know, scrapping for that position and, and wanting to be recognized. And you look back on those days and, man, you just look at some of the younger guys that came through TNA in TNA's early days. I mean, it's quite a roster of names that went on to be pretty good names. I mean, when when you look back to AJ Styles' WWE debut, he debuted at the Rumble in 2016 yeah. in Orlando. You could hear, if you watch back, the ovation that he got because people knew who he was. Yeah. It was a it was like a megastar moment. Yeah, yeah, and AJ was one of those guys you knew from the beginning, like he he was going to be something. He just just. He just had it. So um, th- there were several of those guys. I mean, I remember looking back, um, the amazing red. I mean, mm-hmm. some of the stuff that that kid would do, and you know, the only thing probably holding him back was his size. But nonetheless, I mean, some of those guys and some of those matches, especially with like Jerry Lynn and some of the uh, older guys that did that high flying style. But then they brought in a lot of the younger guys that did that high flying style. And some of the matches that they had in the early days of TNA were just nuts. Yeah, the X division was was hot, man. It was like the one of the biggest draws in that company, especially yeah, back then. But I, I mean, I think it set us aside, made us a little different from anything else that was out there. The six sided ring, I mean, very u- <laughs> well. It's unique. It's- it looked cool, but it sucked to work in. Really? Terrible. Yeah. What happened? Well, with having those extra sides, it takes some getting used to positioning wise and knowing where to go and knowing which direction to hit the ropes. And it makes it even more difficult if you're doing tag matches, because then it's just the physics of it makes it difficult. And then with the ropes being shorter, because there's more corners, the ropes were like hitting a brick wall. It was terrible. Um, The only thing that was good, like if you climb the ropes and you were going to do something off the top, it was great because they, were strong and supportive, but just randomly hitting the ropes, nowhere near as comfortable as a four-sided ring. And it's probably most likely hard on your body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a decent bumping ring just because it was like that old WCW style. But, yeah, there were no soft spots in that ring whatsoever. Who put you guys together, you and Chase Stevens? You guys both were a tag team called the Naturals. Yeah, we – um at the time, so like I said, they were running the fairgrounds in Nashville mm-hmm. on Wednesdays. 
Well, Bert Prentice, who was a Nashville promoter forever, he was also helping with that. So like on Fridays or Saturdays, he would run the, the, uh, the fairgrounds as well and use TNA's ring and some in their stage and a couple other things. So we were still running that building, not tagging at the time, but I believe it was Bert because Bob Ryder was also helping Bert book shows during that same time. And so it was either Bert or Bob or maybe both of them. I can't remember exactly, but it just kind of, kind of came together. Okay. You guys had an incredible run there. Yeah. Any, any favorite opponents you enjoyed working with? Well, I mean, we always had a good match with AMW. I mean, it didn't matter, you know, if it was on TV, pay-per-view or a house show. Uh, you know, working in Team Canada was usually fun. No matter which combination that you had, Team Canada was always good. Always liked working uh, Showtime just because we were such good friends. Uh, but, yeah, any of those guys, man, there was – I mean, you never – you just knew when you showed up, it didn't matter who you were working, especially in the tag team division, you, you were going to be able to have a good match. They really did have some really cool tag teams back then. AMW was one. You had the James gang. Uh, yeah. So many three life crew. Yeah. Yeah. So many. yeah it, was, uh, it was, then you had Michael Shane. He was tagging with some different guys. And then you had, I mean, there was just, yeah, there is, I mean, you were just going to get, you were going to have a, you didn't have to worry about your safety. You didn't have to worry about really much of anything. Um, and unfortunately, most of the best matches, especially tag matches, happened on house shows because the downside of doing TV, especially when we were just stuck at one hour, it was very common to just get like eight or 10 minutes for mm -hmm. a tag team match, which is very difficult. Uh, and that would sometimes get cut down to like six minutes by the time you walk out through the curtain. So, yeah, it was difficult to have a good tag match on TV, but when we were doing like a lot of either the house shows or those uh, Hermie Sadler, the NASCAR guy, when he was running mm -hmm. some TNA shows, those were usually the best, the best matches. And you got some TV exposure too. Yeah, yeah, a lot of TV exposure. Were you around before the Spike TV era? No, we were there during that. I, okay. I was around before that, but we were there for that as well. Okay, I mean that was huge. That, yeah, that was. I think that was about the only time that they were truly the company was profitable was when they were doing Spike TV. Definitely, I mean that was a big deal because back then WWE controlled the the market as far yeah. as television goes. You have another company after WCW got bought out after ECW folded. Here's this rising upstart company. It gets a TV deal, a prime time spot, and it got a lot of ratings. A lot of people enjoyed it. Yeah, and that was that was just the, the timing of everything because when I first got into the business and I was training and you know starting up the independence, it was exciting because there was multiple options. There's places that you could go, especially if you weren't you know like six six three hundred pounds bodybuilder type. You had WCW that had a huge roster. You had ECW which had a decent sized roster of even some smaller guys. But the, the scary thing was it wasn't shortly after. I got into the business is when WCW folded, ECW got bought out, and then I was like, crap, there's WWE or nothing. And then TNA came along and at least gave a, a you know, another place where guys could go work. And they're, and they're still thriving today. Who would have thought, you know, over 20 some years later, they're still here? Yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. I couldn't tell you how many times people thought they were going to go out of business or go bankrupt or whatever. And it's just like the little engine that could, they just keep going, man. Yeah, and hopefully it'll continue to prosper. Yeah, as long as guys have a place to work and they can get paid to do so, the more the merrier. Absolutely. Let's switch gears and talk about the charity work that you've done outside of wrestling. I know you also are a chiropractor. Tell me about some of the stuff you've done as far as helping people is concerned. Well, yeah, I, I am a chiropractor. Once I retired, I retired from wrestling in 2010. And then shortly after that, I went back to school to chiropractic college, which took about four and a half years. Um, but yeah, I've got my uh, National Neck and Back is my practice in the Madison Rivergate area. It's just a little bit north of Nashville, kind of close to Hendersonville. Um, but yeah, it's uh, we do a lot of, I like to do stuff, especially like around Christmas time. Um, the local police always do a... Uh, 
they change the name like shop with the cop or something like that where they go out and they buy like a lot of toys for underprivileged kids so we uh, we participate in that every year to hopefully you know benefit some of the and it's local kids too so that's what i like to uh helping out local families so that's that's what we do a lot of stuff and we just do a lot of other donations for local charities around like the sumner county and davidson county type areas and you're very passionate about giving back to the community as we've talked about uh here so far on the podcast yeah. uh and now you have had a story about getting into the chiropractor field tell me about that yeah well it was just uh you know, I was kind of just fumbling around, didn't know what I was going to do after I retired from wrestling. Um, wanted to do something that was going to be, you know, financially stable. Um, and the first thing I did is I was doing some personal training, which was okay. It was decent money, but it wasn't what I wanted to do forever. Um, and then it just, my wife and I got to talking and she was the one that actually brought it up. She's like, Hey, have you ever thought about, you know, chiropractic school? Uh, and I hadn't at that time, I had never thought about it, but I did have a cousin that had been a chiropractor for many years and he had done very well for himself. I myself was a patient of chiropractic ever since probably middle school. So one thing after another just kind of clicked. And next thing I know, we were taking a trip to St. Louis to tour a, a campus. And shortly after that, I was signed up and back in school. That's what I enjoyed when I was doing the personal training is, you know, I was one-on-one -on -one working with somebody that wanted to improve their health. Um, and we were able to track that and see their progress. And I think the transition to chiropractic kind of just made sense. You, you know, you're one-on-one -on -one with the patient, you're helping them progress through their health issues or their, you know, their health goals. And it just, it's fulfilling, you know, to be able to, to help somebody get better. What's your favorite part about being working as a chiropractor? Just seeing people get better, man. I see people come in, they're in tears, they're in a wheelchair, they're crawling in the front door because they can't stand up. Or they've been dealing with something for 15, 20 years and no other chiropractor's been able to help them. And they come into my office and we get them better, man. It's it's pretty awesome experience. It's pretty awesome to see. And it definitely helps save lives too. Yeah, I mean, it's it's your health. You know, your health is the most important thing. And right now in America, we don't have true health care. You know, we have sick care. You know, they just want to prescribe you as much as they can prescribe you and make you take as many pills. And, you know, a, a cured patient isn't profitable. So they don't want you to get cured. They just want you to keep taking the meds. So that's my biggest goal is to get people off medications that they don't need to be on, get them out of pain, get them living their best life. I love to hear that. Andy, I want to say thank you for coming on to the show. It means a lot to me and to the listeners and viewers that are watching this on YouTube. Where can people find more about you? So we're on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. I do have a YouTube channel. All you have to do is search National Neck and Back. Um, I'm not as active as I used to be on social media just because the algorithms change so much and it becomes exhausting, <laughs> but I am still on there. I still check it. So you can, you can find Nashville neck and back on any of those social platforms, or you can Google us. But like I said, we're in the Madison Rivergate area. If you need any type of care, my office also specializes in car accident patients. So if you've been injured in a car accident, I specialize in that. And my other biggest specialty is called spinal decompression which is targeted at disc issues. So if you have symptoms or pain that runs down your arms or down your legs, that's a very specific treatment that targets the root cause of those issues. And not every chiropractor does that, but we specialize in it. All right. Well, Andy, thanks again. And you're more than welcome to come back. All right, man. Thanks for the interview. I appreciate it. Of course. Take care. This is Wrestling With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.